All right. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for coming to our, our first event to kick off the kick of 2023. Uh, 2023. Um, we're starting off with a crash course in, in physiology and pharmacology. Uh, these It's a set of webinars, um, each kind of based off the um, uh, curriculum from the Royal Colleges. So hopefully it will be useful for um, junior doctors kind of maybe wanting to get a head, bit of a head start on their primary exams or just medical students who are keen. So um, today's event will be on ventilation. I'm just trying to change, there we go. Um, so we're gonna go for about an hour. I'll introduce our speaker in a bit. Um, and at the end, we'll leave about 10 to 15 minutes to go through question, uh, questions. Uh, if you want to leave a question, uh, we've got a slider link, which should be the next slide. Yep. Um, Hannah will post it into the chat uh, for you guys too. Um, and we'll also have it at the end. Um, so if you've got any questions, feel free to post it there. Um, and feel free to also upgrade questions that you want answered first, because we might not be able to get through all of them. Right. Um, and introducing our speaker, we have Dr. Jeremy Weiss. Uh, he is a ICU senior registrar from the Austin Health. He graduated um, from Melbourne Uni in 2015. Um, and after a brief foray in basic physician training, he transitioned to critical care. And he's been a second trainee since 2018 and completed his primary exams in 2019. And he's currently studying for his fellowship exam, which is in March. So <laughs> thank you, Jeremy, for taking time out of your time out of your study time to speak here. Um, he, uh, outside, of, outside of work, he's interested in medical education and enjoys going on bushwalks with his dog, Monty. So I'll pass on to you now, Jeremy. Just... I'll just share my screen. Okay, is that coming through? All good? Yep. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Cool. Uh, well, thanks for having me. Thanks for introducing me. Um, yep, so I'm going to talk about basics of ventilation. Uh, the dog Monty may make appearances throughout the lecture at boring bits to keep us going along. Um, but let's try to make it a bit interactive because especially the physiology stuff can be a bit dry until we get to the actual meat and bones of the talk, which is mechanical ventilation uh, and invasive ventilation. So we're going to talk about basics of ventilation. A uh, bit of an overview here. So first we'll talk about basic physiology. Uh, I'll be honest, it's going to be quite brief because it's a bit of a dull topic and you want to get really into it when you're studying for your primary exams, everyone. Uh, but until then, it's probably just going to go in one ear out the other. So it's good to just know the basics of it and learn what we do in health and then what we do in pathology. And then we'll talk about different types of ventilation. So we'll talk about positive pressure ventilation, which is what we use uh, in modern medicine as opposed to negative pressure ventilation. Uh, we'll talk about when to use one version of positive pressure ventilation, like non-invasive, over-invasive. Uh, we'll do some terminology about different things like PEEP. Uh, and then we'll talk about um, different examples and cases. And then we'll talk about setting up the ventilator, basic sort of settings for it, the different modes, what they all mean, what the waveforms look like, and then one or two special circumstances for ventilation. So we'll start with basic physiology. Um, so as I said, <laughs> this part's a bit dull, so let's push through it. Let's look at the fun dog picture. Uh, humans normally use negative pressure to generate airflow. Uh, so when we're breathing in, what's the main muscle that we use to get airflow in? Yes, I see diaphragm. I see everyone's saying diaphragm. Perfect, you're all on it. So the diaphragm, uh, big sheet-like muscle at the base of the thorax. You breathe in, it pushes down, it creates more space in the thorax, creates negative pressure, and then pressure goes from high to low. And then expiration, how do we normally expire? If we're just breathing passively, how does expiration occur? Is there a muscle involved? That's a bit of a leading question. 
Yep, I see passively. Yep. So in normal tidal volume, so just breathing in and out at rest, uh, it's just passive relaxation of the chest wall, just collapses down, then the lungs collapse down, generates positive pressure in the alveolus and air is pushed out. So the diaphragm, the most important muscle of inspiration, as I said, contracts down, creates negative intrathoracic pressure. And I mean, it's pretty simple. It, it just goes from high pressure to low pressure, uh, just a current that flows in. And then when you breathe out, pressure increases and the air flows out. Now, what's a tidal volume breath? Because uh, that's another thing we're going to talk about when we talk about ventilation. We're going to set tidal volume breaths and we're going to be interested in what sort of volumes people get. So what does a tidal volume mean? Quiet breathing. Yep, no, that's good. So we've got a little diagram here. So essentially at rest, when you're taking breaths in and out, that's tidal breathing, that's tidal volumes. And then you can take in a big breath and that's your inspiratory reserve volume. And if you breathe all the way out past the tidal volume, that's your expiratory reserve volume. So you learn this when you're studying for exams, but there's a number of volumes that you can measure. And then there's capacities, which are combinations of the volumes. So your vital capacity is like, if you breathe out all the way and then you take a really big deep breath in, that's the total amount of air you can essentially breathe in. So that's your vital capacity. So we often like to measure these to see what the total capacity is of people's breathing in their lungs and what their reserve is. Um, but tidal volumes are the breaths we're normally going to be taking. And that's what we're going to set up when we set up the ventilator. So then the next determinant um, of air flowing in and out is resistance. And the biggest factor affecting resistance is the airway radius. So as your radius gets smaller, airway resistance increases. And a good way to think about it is extraluminal, luminal, and intraluminal factors that will affect your airway radius. So extraluminal, things like compressing on the airway, like a tumor, if there's lots of air from pneumothorax, it's going to push down, it's going to increase your resistance. Luminal resistance, you can imagine bronchoconstriction, so the airway ends up closing up, and that's going to increase your resistance. And then intraluminal, you can imagine sputum, aspiration, fluid, pus, just everything inside the airway. That's all good going to increase the resistance of air going in and out. And then finally, a factor to think about is compliance. So compliance is the change in volume for unit of pressure in the lungs. Um, so it's delta V change in V over change in P. So what that means is how much pressure is needed to get a set amount of volume. So if your compliance is really good, just a tiny bit of pressure will give you heaps and heaps of volume, inflate your lungs really easily. If your compliance is very poor, you need high amounts of pressure to get little bits of volume change. And that's really important because compliance comes into play with different pathology states. So high compliance, um, it's not that common compared to low compliance and we don't care about it as much. It's basically less elastic recoil in the lungs. So you can imagine conditions like emphysema or even in aging, uh, the alveolar tissues sort of break down a bit um, with emphysema and you lose that elastic recoil. So when you're breathing in and out, when you breathe in, it's easier to inflate but then breathing out, they actually collapse quite easily because they don't have that elastic recoil and gas can trap inside the alveoli because they collapse down so quickly. Um, so that's why you get some gas retention, gas trapping in COPD and emphysema. And then low compliance states have really stiff lungs. So these ones require heaps of pressure to inflate. So things like pulmonary fibrosis, um, where the lungs are all fibrosed, the alveoli are fibrosed, it takes a lot of pressure to open them up and you might get very minimal volumes compared to other conditions. We'll talk about ARDS a bit later because that's a special um, ICU um, condition which comes up a lot and it's got very special ventilator requirements unlike other conditions. This is a graph just to show the same sort of thing. So this is a compliance curve. So you're graphing volume versus pressure. And you can see as pressure increase, volume increases. In conditions like pulmonary fibrosis, that change is very small. In conditions like emphysema, the change is very great. So next we're going to talk about positive pressure ventilation. Uh, this is an iron lung. It used to deliver negative pressure ventilation. Uh, so times of polio, this is how people would be ventilated. They'd be in this machine. It would create a negative a vacuum, a negative pressure, and the lungs would expand, uh, essentially because you're creating negative intrapleural pressure and air would go in. Basically how you would breathe normally. Uh, so I've actually stopped that. So we're not using what we would normally use with inspiratory pressures, with negative pressures. Now we use positive pressure instead. 
In the image of positive pressures, we don't need this giant box surrounding the patient. It's easy to do patient care. It's more effective. It's more portable, uh, generally a lot safer. So before we talk about positive pressure ventilation, we need to talk about PEEP. Uh, PEEP is very important. It is positive end expiratory pressure. So what that means is, imagine your breath in and a breath out. At the very end of your breath out, how much pressure is there in the alveoli? So normally it should be about zero, uh, but what we do often with, with ventilating is we apply extra pressure on that breath out, and that's a constant pressure. So a device like CPAP is a continuous positive airway pressure, and that just applies this PEEP. So it's like five or 10 centimeters of water that's just constantly being applied to your lungs and keeping them splintered and broken open. And there's a few things that this does. It splints the airways open. So if you've got lots of gas trapping and your alveoli easily collapse down, PEEP essentially has this constant pressure there and prevents that collapse from happening. So you can imagine people with COPD or emphysema where their lungs very easily collapse down and trap gas. That prevents that by just keeping them open. It prevents de recruitment So your lungs can collapse down when you're at rest or you're lying down flat for too long. And by having some extra PEEP, extra pressure there, it stops them from de-recruiting. It also reduces airway resistance, prevents collapse, and improves compliance as well to reduce your work of breathing. I'll give you a demonstration about how it improves compliance. So here we've got that compliance curve. And you can see here, the curve starts off kind of, kind of at a slant, and then it goes up a really steep gradient, and then it tapers off again towards the top. Now, if you add PEEP, you push them into this part of the curve, which has really high gradient and the compliance is a lot better. The way to picture it is imagine a giant inflatable balloon castle that's completely deflated. And let's say you try to blow that up. It's going to be really hard. You're going to use a lot of pressure at the start and get very little in the way of volume. And really only once you're really far in, we actually start to get some volume changes and it'll be a bit easier. If the balloon castle is partially inflated and you start to blow it up, you'll see a lot more bang for your buck and it will start to inflate a lot faster. That's the basic idea behind PEEP and the compliance curve. You're putting a bit of air in there at the start to make it a lot easier to push it up and down to the lungs. So when people have that PEEP applied to their lungs, they actually find it a lot easier to breathe because they're on that favorable part of the compliance curve. There are some side effects to PEEP, which might be good or might be bad. It's got a lot of cardiovascular effects. So what we're doing with PEEP is we're applying constant pressure to the thoracic space. Um, and it's got respiratory benefits, obviously, because uh, it's pressure in the lungs, it's keeping them open, it's letting air go in and out easier. But that also has effects on the heart as well, because your heart's also sitting there in the intrathoracic space and also gets affected by changes in pressure. So if you imagine increased pressure in the thorax, you know, less venous return coming through, less blood filling the heart. You're also going to get um, less pressure against the LV because the LV has a transmural pressure, which is basically the pressure is between the LV and the thorax. And that's positive, the pressure is different. So it's going to reduce your LV afterload. And it's going to lower your blood pressure because you're getting reduced preload uh, coming back to your heart. So in some patients, these might be detrimental effects. You can imagine if you're a normal healthy person and maybe a bit hypovolemic, and suddenly I put you on a CPAP machine with really high pressures, you have reduced cardiac output coming out, you have reduced venous return, uh, and you might become hypotensive. If you have acute pulmonary edema, which we'll talk about soon, these are actually beneficial effects. So that's why we put people with APO on NIV or CPAP. So we're going to talk about non-invasive ventilation first before we talk about invasive ventilation. Uh, I've stolen this picture here, which is someone with an NIV mask on. Um, I don't know if you've seen NIV masks or NIV working before. Uh, it's essentially, it's a really tight, like sort of scuba mask that goes on your face and really high pressure to push through there. It's very uncomfortable, leaks a lot, causes pressure injuries. People generally don't like it. Having said that, it does help with work of breathing. Um, so off, sometimes if it's, the settings are right and the patient's really sick and they're getting improvement from it, they'll tolerate a lot better because it's helping them breathe a lot easier. So there's two basic settings for non-invasive ventilation. There's PEEP, which you talked about before, which was what the CPAP provides, but CPAP doesn't ventilate. So CPAP just gives you a single pressure. What non-invasive ventilation does is it creates a pressure difference. So you have PEEP, the end expiratory pressure that's constantly there, and then you have pressure support. 
So when you take a breath in, it gives you a bit of extra pressure as well to give you a bit of a breath. So that's ventilation. So you've got breathing in and out and gas exchange is occurring. Uh, with CPAP, it's just a constant pressure. So the patient has to breathe on top of that, but this is helping the patient. So they actually get better tidal volumes with that and helps more with CO2 clearance. You can even um, mandatory ventilate people as well with this. So if you've got hypoventilation overnight uh, and you just stop breathing, you can actually have NIV devices which will generate mandatory breaths, so breathing for them while they're sleeping. Uh, you can't do that with CPAP because it's just one pressure. It's not actually generating breaths in and out. It's just giving that one single pressure. So there's some advantages to using NIV. Uh, one of the big ones is that it avoids intubation. Intubation is really fraught with peril for some patients. Uh, they can arrest. They can have hypotensive episodes. Um, they might not be appropriate for intubation, but they might be appropriate for NIV from their comorbidities or goals of care. Um, so it can avoid or delay intubation. There's really good evidence for use in APO and COPD, some evidence for asthma, uh, and it basically decreases the amount of work people need to breathe in and out uh, by applying these positive pressures. There are some disadvantages. Uh, as we talked about, it can cause pressure injuries around the, the nose and the mouth. Uh, often they leak a lot, so it requires a lot of fiddling, a lot of moving around, really high sort of nursing burden, trying to get it to work properly. We talked about the cardiovascular effects, so it can cause hypotension with that increased pressure and reduced venous return. And one of the big things is you really, it's difficult to clear out your airways with it on. So if you've got the pneumonia or something with lots of secretions, it's really hard to cough and get rid of all that stuff with the positive pressure going through. Uh, and also a lot of air can go through and collect a lot of gastric distension. So a patient that's with reduced conscious state or is kind of really not protecting the airway that well, they're at really high risk of aspirating because it's going to be applying all this pressure to their stomach, distending it. And if they vomit or aspirate, uh, they might not be able to protect the airway. So you wouldn't want to use it in a patient that's a bit unconscious or obtundent. So the main indications for NIV are APO, really good evidence based around this, reduces mortality. These patients come in looking absolutely terrible. They look like they're going to die. You put them on NIV for an hour or two and they are ready for the ward. Um, what we talked about earlier with the cardiovascular effects of PEEP uh, and NIV, they, it all works beneficially for APO. So the reduced LV afterload will reduce your myocardial work. So reduce the sort of ischemic injury and make your heart beat a lot easier. The reduced RV preload, so you've got less venous return coming back. It can actually be helpful because your ventricles are often quite distended when you're in pulmonary edema because the heart is failing. And by reducing the amount of venous return, you give time for the heart to pump out that fluid. And if you remember that Frank Starling curve where contractility increases until it doesn't at a certain point when there's too much volume, you basically push them to a more favorable part of that Frank Starling curve. Uh, so their heart starts to beat a lot better. And it can even just force fluid out of the alveoli by applying positive pressure down there. So APO and NIV, they go together great. COPD also has a very good evidence base for it. Uh, if you remember what we're talking about with the compliance in COPD, uh, emphysema, how the airways collapse down on breathing. Well, what we can do with NIV is keep the airways splinted open and stop those airways from collapsing while the patient's breathing. It'll improve the amount of CO2 they're clearing, reduce their CO2 levels, and also helps with their work of breathing as well. And then asthma has, it's probably, it's got the worst evidence base for all of these. So it's not like a clear cut indication like these other two. And the studies don't show it actually reduce mortality, but it's still really widely used. Um, similar to the benefits of COPD in that it splints the airways open to prevent them from collapsing and reduces work of breathing. Uh, and it can also counteract the sort of airway resistance you get in asthma and just help with their tidal volumes and their work of breathing. So it's a bit of a softer indication asthma, but APO and COPD definitely NIV. Next is invasive ventilation. So I'm sure some of you might have seen this is an endotracheal tube. Uh, so it goes through the glottis down the trachea. Uh, this little balloon sits there in the trachea and then air goes in and out through the tube. Uh, the great thing about this is that it protects your airway. So if you have gastric contents, they're stopped by this balloon uh, and you can generate pressure directly into the airway as opposed to NIV, which is just pushing it into the oropharynx where it could go down the esophagus, could go anywhere, could leak out. This is going to direct your pressure straight down the trachea, straight into the lungs. So the advantage of this, uh, it's a good long-term solution compared to NIV. 
there's minimal leak compared to the NIV because you're directly in the airway and you have this cuff, this balloon up, which will prevent stuff from leaking out. You protect the airway. You can deliver higher pressures than you can with NIV because you're directed down there as well. Uh, and you can put suction catheters through there. You can put a bronchoscope down there if you want samples. Uh, it's a lot safer for transporting patients. You can sedate the patients because their airway is protected now. They don't need to breathe. They don't need to cough or protect their airway for anything. So it's got a lot of good advantages. Uh, the disadvantage is obviously it's highly invasive. So to put these in, you need the patient sedated, you apply paralysis. Uh, it's fraught with risk if they're quite unstable, they can arrest when you're trying to put these in. And then once it's in, there's risks of pneumonia, there's pressure injuries, uh, prolonged ICU stay. Um, so definitely it has a place, but you don't want to put it in everyone. So I've got a few scenarios here, which uh, maybe we'll open up to the chat for each of these. So the first one we're going to talk about, well, we'll talk about all of them at the end, but this is a 65-year-old man with pro progressive ascending muscular weakness after a recent gastrointestinal illness. He's had a forced vital capacity uh, of 20 mils per kilogram, which uh, was 25 mils per kilogram earlier. And he's had increased work of breathing with his rest rate increasing and use of accessory muscles. So what condition do we think this guy has? Yes, perfect. <laughs> Guillaume Barre after Campbell back to Jejuna diarrhea. I love it. Yes. Um, so classic. Uh, I, don't, I haven't seen it with gastro <laughs> despite the classic sort of appearance for it. Um, it's usually just viral from what I've seen. But yeah, so this guy's got Guillaume Barre. Uh, and then the question would be, what's his trajectory with this condition gonna be? Uh, and what sort of ventilation would be best for him? Would non-invasive ventilation be best? Would invasive ventilation be best? Um, let's just get a bit of a poll in the chat. Who thinks non-invasive? Who thinks invasive? Who thinks nothing? Invasive, invasive, invasive. Yeah, good. I'm seeing a lot of invasive and he'll go through it, but I think invasive for him. Uh, I guess the big key thing here is he's not gonna get better. He's gonna get worse. Uh, he's getting worse and this condition might take months to get better. So it's really not good for long-term NIV. I mean, you could stay on NIV briefly and see how he goes for a day or two, but you're really just delaying inevitable. The next one, so a seven year old lady, she's woken up with acute shortness of breath. She's got widespread crackles on her chest X-ray. She's got a CO2 of 60 and a bicarb of 34. And she's needing 15 liters of oxygen for SATs of 94%. So they're not very good numbers. What condition do you think she has? Yep, I love it already. APO, yep, APO. NIV, APO, good, <laughs> yes. We're all remembering about NIV and APO. Uh, I guess the interesting thing is also, what do we think about this blood gas? I know this isn't a blood gas talk, but I'm ICU training, so I love blood gases. Uh, are we worried about that CO2? So chronic CO2 retention, yes. Yeah, so look, the CO2 is 60, which is like it's in the type 2 respiratory failure. Um, but interesting, like the bicarb is 34. Um, so essentially the rule is uh, for every 10 of CO2 over 40, in chronic CO2 retention, you get a bicarb increase of five. So if normal CO2 is 40, this is 20 higher than normal. Uh, and the bicarb is 10 higher than normal. So this is actually would be a picture for a chronic respiratory acidosis that's fully compensated with metabolic alkalosis. Um, so basically this, this is an appropriately compensated blood gas. It's not acutely deteriorated. You'd be worried if the CO2 was much higher than this, that suggests it's an acute deterioration or if the bicarb is much lower than this. But this patient probably has a normal pH on their blood gas. So there's not like an acute deterioration. This is probably their baseline respiratory function. Uh, the hypoxia is worrying, but as we've said, APO, NIV works great. And then next patient, so... 24 year old man found unconscious at the bus stop with vomit around their mouth, their GCS3, they're breathing fine, their SATs are 98% and their CO2 is a bit elevated. Uh, what should we do for this guy? 
talking about invasive anatomic airway, invasive, check raised RCP, that's a good question. Yes, invasive, yeah. So, I mean, like his oxygenation is fine. His CO2 is slightly high, but really the GCS3 with the vomit around the mouth, you're thinking this guy's vomiting and he's not going to be coughing that up. He's just going to be aspirating. Uh, non-invasive is just going to make this a lot worse. You would not want to give him non-invasive ventilation. I mean, he doesn't need it with those numbers, but that would be absolute no-no. Uh, so yeah, invasive ventilation would be for him. And then 30-year-old female with acute wheezing dyspnea, really high work of breathing, respirate 38, but she's maintaining her SATs and her CO2 is 35 on the gas with the normal pH. This one's a bit trickier. What do we think it is? What, what condition do we think this is? Asthma attack. Yep, asthma. Uh, do we want to intubate someone with asthma? Uh, I guess if you've done a bit of reading about this topic or if you've experienced this before, the answer will be very obvious, but it might not be otherwise. But what do we think about intubating someone with asthma? Pressures. Avoid if possible. No question mark. Yeah, um, we'll go through a bit. You want to hold off into making these people as long as possible. Uh, the issue is, can make AOA hypersensitive and worse. Yeah. Um, they're often just hang on by a thread and they're often doing a better work of breathing than you can do by putting them on the ventilator. As soon as you put them on the ventilator and you're applying positive pressure and they've already got a lot of gas trapping, a lot of bronchoconstriction, you can cause a lot of damage by applying extra pressure through the circuit to that whole situation. Uh, levels of bronchospasm, you need really high pressures to ventilate them, they get pneumothoraxes, um, it's, it's bad. Uh, it's very, very rare these days to have to intubate people with asthma. Asthma control is usually a lot, a lot better now than it was in the old days. Um, but this is one of those special scenarios where you really have to think twice before intubating these people. So when do we need to assist people's ventilation? So it supports fresh gas exchange. So CO2 clearance uh, provides fresh oxygen, Ventilation involves both inspiration and expiration. So as we saw before, CPAP is not ventilation. It's just a single pressure. But NIV and mechanical ventilation both give you that constant pressure and an inspiratory pressure as well. So ventilation is occurring, so gas exchange is occurring. And then there's other reasons why you need ventilation systems. So airway protection, like that guy with the low GCS. So tolerate anesthetic procedures. If they've got airway obstruction or edema, if they've got impaired cough or gag reflexes, they've got some sort of neurological condition where they're aspirating constantly, they might need that airway protection. So in those cases, the lungs, in the case of the lungs are actually fine, uh, but the airway is affected and they need to protect it with an invasive intubation. Hypoventilation, hypercapnia. So we talk about Guillain-Barre, reduced respiratory drive, patients with spinal cord injuries. If they're a high cervical spine injury, they might not have diaphragmatic power and they might need long-term ventilation as well. Some at the Austin, where the spinal cord center, and we've also got VRSS, which is the Victorian Respiratory Support Service. So they do invasive ventilation. So like people on long-term trachees, long-term NIV, and a lot of the spinal patients will require that as well if their injury level is high enough. And then severe hypoxia as well. So pneumonia, really bad pneumonias, APO and ARDS, which again, we'll talk about soon. So what to think about before ventilating someone. So, Patient factors. Uh, so you've got to think about their physiological reserve, their anatomy, how easy the intubation is going to be, how difficult is it going to be, is it going to be possible at all, is there superglottic obstruction, are they very obese, will they need a lot of positioning? And that might deter you from intubating them. You might think, oh, this person's had a, a grade three or grade four airway previously, let's hold off as long as possible. There's also disease factors. So things like the Guillain-Barre syndrome, it's reversible, but it's going to take a long time uh, and they're probably going to progress to make, be worse. Uh, so you think, oh, this isn't immediately reversible, so they'll need intubation. And also severity as well. So again, things like pneumonia, how severe is their hypoxia, how bad is their work of breathing, how urgently do we need to do this? In progression, um, so this is really good where the clinical exam comes in, where you can see the work of breathing, the use of accessory muscles, um, and how well they're compensating. And these are the patients you might also want to do serial blood gases and you might see their CO2 starting to rise if they're fatiguing and those are often bad signs that 
people might need support uh, with their ventilation. And then you think about the risks of intubation. So cardiac arrest, failure to intubate, trauma to the airway, and obviously giving drugs and a lot of the muscle relaxants have high rates of anaphylaxis. So you've got to think about those things as well. So it's, it's not without its risks intubating people. Um, and here, that's pretty much what we said earlier. So Guillain-Barre syndrome, with those volumes, I'd say they should be monitored in ICU. Anything less than 25, 20 mils per kilogram force vital capacity should be monitored. And then when they're going sort of below 15, you start to think about intubating them. But there's no real hard and fast rules. It just really depends on the clinical scenario about how they're looking. Lay with APO, uh, as I said before, APO, PEEP, CPAP goes really well together. She actually should clear up hopefully quite well as soon as the non-invasive ventilation or PEEP is applied. And yeah, there's a compensated respiratory acidosis. So the CO2 is less concerning. The man with the GCS3 correctly identified he needs airway protection. And then the acute asthma, yeah, again, positive pressure ventilation is dangerous. So try to avoid as long as possible. So this is our first generic case. Um, so this guy, he's good. He's a 40 year old, 50 year old man. He's got no medical history. He's a non-smoker. He weighs 70 kilograms. He's 175 centimeters. And he's coming with Quincy. Um, so he's had upper airway swelling. Uh, they were very concerned about the upper airway swelling that would progress. Um, so ASX have intubated him. And they've asked you to come down as the maybe junior ICU reg. Uh, to set up the oxy log and bring the patient up to ICU while they're getting theater ready. So this is this is our oxy log. It's a portable ventilator. Um, there'll be different types in different hospitals. Uh, this one I've seen at most hospitals I've been at. Um, it's it's a great device. It's really straightforward to set up. Uh, you can see it shows you on the bottom left um, what settings to use for different patients' weights. And you can pretty much just use these default settings for probably 95% of the patients and they'll be all right. Uh, but we'll go through each of the settings one by one and then we'll think rationally about why we're picking these different settings as we go. So before we start ventilating, we have to think about what variables we need to set on the ventilator. Uh, what do they need to live? So first we're gonna talk about tidal volumes. So what sort of tidal volume do we want to set for a patient? Does anyone have any ideas about numbers about what sort of tidal volume to set? So eight mils per kilo, six mils per kilo, seven mils per kilo. Yes, these are all good, appropriate numbers. I mean, look, this guy, he's young, he's fitting well. You could run him on like eight, 10. You could prick pretty much anything within reason and he would be fine. Uh, if you do anesthetics, you'll see the anesthetists might put people on 600 mils, 700 mils with their ventilator. They're not calculating it by weight. The patients are fine because they're all often quite healthy and the procedures are quite short. It's really when we have people with significant pathology that we are most concerned with the tidal volumes and when people are being ventilated for a long period of time, that's when pathology starts to develop when you're inappropriately ventilating. So six to eight mils per kilogram uh, in healthy patients or patients without, um, where you're not aiming for um, low tidal volume strategy, which we'll talk about later with ARDS. But aside from ARDS, six to eight mils per kilogram, um, but we we'll usually just go with six. And that's predicted body weight. So unfortunately it's blocking off half of this table, but there is a table you can just Google and it will tell you the predicted body weight of people based on their height. Uh, and that's the number you use. You don't use their actual body weight, you use the body weight for their height because as if you're eating and eating and eating and you're super morbidly obese to 600 kilograms, your lungs aren't growing any bigger with that. So you need to use predicted body weight rather than actual body weight. So in normal lungs, six to eight mils per kilogram. Uh, for the lung protective strategy for ARDS, which I promise we'll talk about later, is four to six. But if you just say six, you will cover both of those groups and you'll always be right. So just say six mils per kilogram and it's easy. So this person's 70 kilograms, you do 420 mil tidal volumes. But anywhere between 400, 600 is probably fine for him because he's quite well. Um, he can probably take it. Next, we're going to set the respiratory rate. Uh, so the respiratory rate is part of your minute ventilation. So respiratory rate times total volume is your minute ventilation. And your minute ventilation basically controls how much CO2 you take off. So higher minute ventilation, you're breathing in and out, there's more gas exchange. Your CO2 clearance is going to be higher than lower. So when would you make the respiratory rate high? What is, I mean, we've got to talk about now. 
pass that one to later. Um, if CO2 is high, yes. Basically, so high CO2, if, especially if they got really severe acidosis, you might want to blow it off. Uh, you might not want to do it too long because what's the problem with the high respiratory rate is there for too long? What can actually uh, happen? Yep, raised ICP, yep. So yeah, the issue with, um, with high CO2, your ICP is going to go up because you get increased through blood flow. Um, if you have too high respiratory rate, you'll have the opposite problem where you get an alkalosis and you'll get reduced cerebral blood flow and that could be an issue as well. And the also the problem is if you've got significant gas trapping like bronchoconstriction, um, that's an issue with high respiratory rate. So you wanna be careful with those patients that you're not breathing them too fast, that they're not able to empty their alveoli with enough time. So they want enough time just to completely empty out their alveoli before taking another breath in. Otherwise they're gonna get something called dynamic hyperinflation, which we'll talk about soon. Um, it's basically stacking breaths on top of each other. So the alveoli keep distending and they don't have time to empty out. So high respiratory rate increases minute ventilation and increases CO2 removal. Uh, low rate allows for longer expiratory time and reduces the risk of dynamic hyperinflation. So ventilators will often show you a, something called an IE ratio. And this is when you're setting the respiratory rate or the inspiratory time, it'll tell you what your ratio is. And that's the amount of time set in inspiration versus in expiration. And normally it's about one to two. So you can imagine, like, let's say you spend one second breathing in, you spend two seconds breathing out. And that's generally in healthy people what you try to aim at. If someone's gas trapping, you want a longer ratio, say one to four. So like one second breathing in and then four seconds breathing out. And that's because of gas trapping, you need that extra time to completely empty out the alveoli before taking the breath in. Otherwise you're gonna get stacked breaths. Uh, if you've got really bad restrictive lung disease and your tidal volumes are tiny, you might need a ratio of one to one. So they're going in and out really quickly. And that's the idea of like a restrictive lung disease where your respirate is high, but your tidal volumes are lower as opposed to an obstructive lung disease where you have longer times and lower respiratory rate. Uh, this is just sort of visualizing the IE ratio. So you can see here one second in inspiration and then two seconds in expiration. So that's a one to two ratio. So most patients, you'd set them at one to two and forget about it, except for those special cases. So dynamic hyperinflation I mentioned, but basically people with obstructive lung diseases will have increased end expiratory volume. And when dynamic hyperinflation occurs, there's higher and higher volumes left at the end of each expiration because you, you don't have enough time to completely empty out the alveoli like you should. This can cause alveolar distension. Uh, and if they're very unlucky, they might burst and get a pneumothorax. So these patients with COPD and severe asthma, he set the one to four ratio. Next, we're going to talk about the P max value, uh, which is basically just the maximum pressure of this machine before it alarms off. Uh, usually it's around 40 that you would set at. Uh, it's the peak pressure that the ventilator will deliver. And when it starts, to, it doesn't go beyond there. It'll just make an alarm and tell you that the pressures are too high and then stop. Um, the question then is, is the peak pressure a problem? So there's actually a difference between a peak pressure and a plateau pressure. So the peak pressure is the highest pressure that the machine's gonna get. And that's as the air is coming through the, air, the airways and it's increasing the pressure. That's actually not dangerous. What's dangerous is this thing called the plateau pressure here, which you can see on this curve. And the plateau pressure is the pressure of the alveoli C. And that's the dangerous one because if the plateau pressure is high, that's when the alveoli get damaged, your basement membranes are affected and you can get pneumothorax and rupture. Um, your peak pressure isn't really important. Uh, it's just a sign that maybe your plateau pressure is higher. The, plateau, the peak pressure takes the airway resistance into account. So you imagine someone with really severe bronchoconstriction, uh, their airways are quite narrow and you try to push air through it. That pressure can be super, super high, but that doesn't really reflect the pressure that is experienced in the alveoli. It reflects the pressure experienced in the bronchi and the alveolar pressure is what's causing the damage. So you only wanna measure the plateau pressure or that sort of flat part of the curve there. Uh, the machine is just going to tell you the peak pressure. So that's what your alarm is set for, for that machine. So by itself, the peak pressure isn't harmful for that Pmax value. It might be that there's a lot of bronchoconstriction, which can cause a high peak pressure. Uh, and usually you just leave it 40 centimetres of water. But if it's starting to alarm, you want to look at your plateau pressure and make sure that's not super high as well, because then you're going to run into problems. Uh, we'll go over a bit more of that later. 
Uh, next, we're going to talk about the FiO2, which is circled there at the bottom. Uh, so that's the amount of oxygen that the ventilator is going to deliver. And it's really well studied. There's heaps of studies on this, how much oxygen to give people, how much oxygen is good after cardiac arrest, how much good oxygen is good in sepsis, how much oxygen to give in ICU. Uh, there's heaps of trials out there. They all kind of show mixed results. Uh, what we know is that too much oxygen is bad. Too much oxygen causes free radical generation. Uh, it causes inflammation, tracheitis, uh, atelectasis, because you're removing nitrogen from the lungs, uh, and it can eventually lead to fibrosis. So you don't want people sitting in 100% oxygen for too long. Uh, generally, you want to wean it down to more reasonable numbers, sort of 90 to 98%. Uh, and we also know that hypoxia is harmful, so you don't want the stats going below, like, say, 85, 88. So you want to maintain it somewhere in the normal range. Um, and then the question, what you, should you set this out then? Oops, sorry, let me go back because I didn't answer it. So <laughs> no one knows what the optimal O2 target is. Uh, if it's just temporarily for transport or like anesthetics, you'll often just leave them at an FiO2 of one, like 100%, because um, for a very short amount of time, it's not going to cause a problem. And it will give you a bit of reserve in case something happens and they become hypoxic. There is a bit of reserve there before they suddenly go downhill. So for brief transports, you'd often set them at 100% oxygen, uh, but long-term you want to wean that down uh, and you're basically guided by your SATs and what sort of SATs target you pick. Usually around 94% SATs, uh, PO2 of maybe more than 60 would be appropriate. Uh, if your PO2 is getting more than 100 or your SATs are getting sort of 99, 100, you generally want to wean down the oxygen and that's, that's the safe level. And there's probably not too much difference below that. Then we're going to talk about the PEEP setting for the ventilator. So as we talk about PEEP, it's got a lot of benefits uh, for ventilation and keeping airway splinted open uh, and improving compliance and worker breathing. Patients with no lung pathology are usually just set at five centimetres of water, maybe 10 centimetres of water, especially if they're quite overweight. They might have um, a lot of chest wall compliance issues uh, and the airways collapse down quite easily with atelectasis from the weight of the chest wall. So those patients you might want a higher peak value to keep it splinted open a bit better. Uh, patients with a lot of gas trapping or asthma, you might want a lower or no peep at all because they've already got gas trapping. And if you add extra pressure there, it might create that dynamic hyperinflation situation where you're adding too much pressure on top of the system. And then patients with hypoxia generally respond better to a higher peep. Uh, that's especially in condition ARDS, uh, which is the um, like an acute inflammatory response uh, fibrosis of the lungs and fluid. And there's this ladder which people often follow to set the PEEP. Uh, this is just an example of one of the ways you can set the PEEP for this condition. So basically, depending on what FiO2 they're needing, you would set the PEEP higher and higher. So if they're needing 50%, you would set it either 10 or 16. And that's just shown to improve um, survival rates, having that higher PEEP. So next, we're going to say move on to the ventilator modes. Um, this part's really confusing. Uh, you can see here from this picture, there's a lot of different modes. This is a random ventilator I took in ICU and took a picture of. You see there's a lot of different modes to choose from. And unfortunately, each ventilator is going to have different names for these modes as well. So what might be VCAC on one ventilator might be called something else on another. Um, they do share some things in common. But yeah, unfortunately, there's a lot of horrible proprietary names and these sort of things. So it's best just to know the principles behind the ventilator. And then when you get a specific ventilator, you can figure it out from that one. So the main sort of general thing to look at are whether you want a mandatory mode or a supported mode, and whether you want to deal with volumes or you want to deal with pressure. Um, so what I mean by those is mandatory mode, where you deliver breaths at a set rate, and the patient has no say in whether they get the breath or not, it just keeps delivering it, does its own thing. Uh, that might be really good if the patient is intubated or the patient isn't able to have enough of a respiratory response that's helpful. So you want to set mandatory breaths instead of that. Uh, and supported breaths, <clears throat> they support the patient's breathing. So that's more like a non-invasive ventilation type thing where you have pressure support and the patient takes the breath in and they get a supported breath. So those modes are good because it improves the sort of patient synchronization with the ventilator and they often find it more comfortable breathing with that sort of mode rather than the ventilator just firing on over them and they don't really get a say when they get their breath or not. And then the next question is whether you want to use volume or you want to use pressure. So the end result of these is essentially the same. 
you either set your volume, so you set a target volume of let's say 400, 500 mils, and then the ventilator will adjust the pressure accordingly, or you'd set your pressure. So you might set a pressure of like 15 centimeters of water, and the ventilator will deliver 15 centimeters of water, and then it will adjust the volume <coughs> based on that pressure. Um, so we'll talk about those soon. And yeah, basic modes. So volume control ventilation is VCV, pressure control is PCV, pressure support is PSV, and there's some weirder modes like assist control and SIMV, uh, which we often use as well, which we'll talk about. So we'll talk about volume control. So because it's control, it's a mandatory mode. And because it's volume, we set the volume as our variable. So for this one, you would set a tidal volume, you would set the PEEP and you set the rest rate. And then the pressure will be variable based on what you set that volume at. Um, so I like this mode because it's very straightforward. Um, and I like to setting a volume because then the pressure can just follow, but we really want, want to guarantee certain tidal volumes being delivered. So this is setting up for tidal, for volume control ventilation. So you can see on the machine here, <coughs> you got your FiO2 that you would set, you got your VT, which is tidal volume, which you would set, your TI is your inspiration time. So that's gonna be the amount of time spent in inspiration, uh, how many seconds, and your rest rate, which is 12, um, and then your PEEP. And then your IE ratio will come as you're setting your TI and your rest rate. It will calculate an IE ratio based on what your numbers have set for that. So that's volume. And then this is the waveform for volume ventilation. So in volume control ventilation, you deliver flow as a square waveform, and then the pressure and volume are curves as they go up and down. You can see here what we talked about earlier with the peak pressure and the plateau pressure, uh, that high little blip on the pressure waveform, and that's the peak, and then it drops down after it, after it overcomes your airway resistance, and it becomes plateau pressure once it hits the alveoli line. And notice here the pressure waveform never goes down to zero at the baseline, that's because you're always applying some sort of peak usually when you're ventilating these patients. So if you're applying peak, your pressure line will never go to zero because the peak will keep it above there. Next we'll talk about pressure control mode. So this is also a mandatory mode, so it's control. Uh, you set P insp, which is the inspiratory pressure, and then you set your PEEP and your respiratory rate. So tidal volumes are variable based on the pressure that you're delivering. So <clears throat> if I set 15, it'll deliver X amount of tidal volume depending on how compliant your lungs are. So a really young person, you might get 500 mils from that. Um, if you've got really bad pulmonary fibrosis or something, you might only get 100 or 200 mils from that. Uh, but your pressure will always be the same but your tidal volumes will be quite variable depending on what the patient is like. So you can see here, this is pressure control mode. Um, so we've got FiO2 again, we've got P insp now instead of tidal volume. So we're setting up pressure rather than volume. And then we've got the same other things, we've got inspiratory time, respiratory rate and PEEP. Um, so I've said here, P insp and pressure mode. So it depends on the patient's compliance, how much volume you're gonna get. Um, usually if you start at sort of 15, 20, it's generally safe. Uh, and then you can titrate it accordingly until you get the tidal volumes you want. But you just, you wanna make sure your plateau pressures don't go above 30, cause that's when you start to get barotrauma and issues with lung injury on the ventilator. And this is the waveform for pressure mode. You see here instead, pressure is now delivered as a square wave and flow goes up and down, unlike the, the volume waveform. We'll talk about pressure support. Um, so because we're support now, it's a spontaneous mode. Uh, and this is essentially what the mandatory NIV is giving. So you've got PEEP and you've got pressure support. And if the patient's breathing on top of that, <clears throat> it's delivering pressure supported breaths. Uh, and this one's not delivering mandatory mode, so it's just supported. So they initiate their own breaths and they get a pressure support. Um, Almost every ventilator will have a like apneic mode. So if the patient stops breathing for more than say 20 seconds, it will then switch over now to a mandatory mode as a backup and that's a safety feature. Um, and pretty much every ventilator will have that. So often in ICU, you'll see them trying to make people breathe on their own after they've had anesthetic. And they might be apneic for a long period of time and then the machine will alarm and then it'll just switch them back to volume control mode. And then you try again a bit later once they're more awake. This mode's often used as a step down from ventilating people. Uh, and a bridge towards extubation, because you can imagine if you put people on this mode, they're breathing on their own, you can start reducing the pressures, they're not requiring mandatory breaths. Uh, it's more similar to how they'd be without the tube in, without the ventilator on. 
And this is the setup for the pressure support mode. So you can see you got your FiO2, you got your PEEP, and you got your pressure support. Um, and that's pretty much all you set for this mode. And then, yeah, if they stop breathing, it will flick back to a mandatory mode. And this is a, uh, I guess one nuance to notice is this is a delta pressure support. You can see the little triangle there. Uh, and that means it's the change in pressure. So on top of PEEP, you're giving 10 centimeters of water. So it's not 10 total, it's 10 on top of the five. So they'll get 15 total from that because that little the delta. And this is a waveform that shows what happens with pressure support mode. Uh, and you see the ventilators often have little, it might be like little grayed out areas if they are taking their own breaths. Well, some of the ventilators have like a blue outline or a yellow outline, depending on if it's a mandatory or supportive breath. So you can tell if the patient's initiating the breath or the ventilator's doing it. So you can see here, yeah, they've got a constant peak. And when they take a breath in, it delivers an extra pressure. Uh, SIMV uh, is a bit of a mix of the modes. So it's called, it stands for intermittent, synchronized intermittent mandatory ventilation. Uh, what that means is it mandates a certain number of breaths and a certain type of volumes, but outside of that, the patient can breathe in and out on their own and the machine will deliver supported breaths. So it's a bit of a mix between control mode and supported mode. And this can be either volume or pressure, but just imagine it as a hybrid of the two modes. So the patient gets supported breaths when they want to breathe on top of the ventilator, but the ventilator will still ventilate them a certain amount. So you're not going to get that sort of long periods of apnea or deoxygenation or anything like that because the ventilator is doing the work for them still. Uh, and you can see here, SIMV, it's very similar to volume control mode. So you got FiO2, you got tidal volume, you got respiratory rate, and you got PEEP, but you also set the pressure support as well. So when they take a breath on their own, the pressure support gets delivered. So it's just a, a combination of those two modes. Uh, this is probably the most common mode, at least at the Austin ICU. Um, Cause yeah, you set the volumes, when the patient starts breathing on their own, you can see it, it supports them and improves the synchronization between the patient and the ventilator rather than just sort of stuck with mandatory mode. Uh, and then there's assist control ventilation, which um, is basically quite similar to SIMV, but with this one, when the patient breathes in, it will assist them towards a target volume rather than just giving them a bit of pressure. So with the other mode, it gave them like say 10 of pressure spot on their breath. With this mode, it will calculate a certain amount of pressure they need to achieve a set target volume as well. Um, so sorry, that was a bit, <laughs> it's a bit much and there's a lot of information, uh, but now we can talk about the cases. So does anyone want to look at this ventilator waveform and say, what is unusual about this? So this, it's not quite our stock standard way that we set up the ventilator for the transport patient. There's something unusual about this one. And what do we think the pathology is here? I guess the big thing to look at there would be the, um, the flow curve and look at the, uh, so inspiratory is above the line and expiratory is below the line. And the IE ratio, yep, that's good. So you can see our IE ratio, it's at one to four. And look at the rest rate, the rest rate's 10, which is quite low. So this is a case of gas trapping. Uh, this person's got COPD. So it's not quite dynamic hyperinflation because We've set up the ventilator appropriately and we're giving them enough time to completely breathe out before we're delivering another breath. So these patients, you want to look at that expiratory flow part of that curve and you want to make sure it hits zero, it hits the, um, it basically hits this line before you deliver another breath. Because if we, if we were delivering one to two breaths, we would be delivering breaths before they've had time to fully expire. You can see here, at even at like completely the end of expiration, it's taking all that time for them to completely expire all that gas. So if we were delivering breaths on top of that, we would be giving gas trapping, they would have dynamic hyperinflation, and then they might eventually get tension in the thorax at that point. So they're actually, otherwise it's pretty standard settings. So pressures aren't too high, it's only 24. They've got good tidal volumes uh, and they're not needing much oxygen at all. So it's really just that rest rate and the IE ratio. Um, so yeah, rest rate set a bit low and the IE ratio is elevated. Um, we're not going to talk about capnography, uh, but it's just another thing to look at as well. So it's basically measurement of patient CO2 trace. Um, so it measures the amount of CO2 breathed out uh, and it creates this little curve here. <clears throat> uh, and this white line is our capnograph. Normally it should be a square wave, 
Uh, but this patient uh, has got what they call a shark fin pattern, uh, which symbolizes gas trapping. So normally your alveoli empty uniformly. Um, so they all empty out at the same rate. Uh, so it should just create a little square when you breathe out. This patient, there's a lot of gas trapping. There's a lot of uneven emptying of the alveoli. Um, you might remember the stuff from medical school about fast and slow alveoli, where some of them empty really quickly and some of them collapse down really quickly. Um, that's basically what's at play here. So it takes a long time for all the alveoli to empty out evenly and you get this characteristic pattern on their waveform there. Uh, next we're gonna talk, oops, sorry. Next we're gonna talk about asthma. Um, so as we said, asthma, bronchoconstriction causes really high peak pressures. Uh, and peak pressures, again, they're not the concerning thing. It's always plateau pressure that causes damage. But asthma is one of those cases where your peak pressures get very high because you get lots of bronchoconstriction and there's lots of resistance to airflow going through. So this is a, um, a waveform. Uh, this is from volume control ventilation. And you can see here the inspired pressure is over 40 for this, but the plateau pressure is actually normal. It's actually under 20. So this is typical of acute, really severe asthma, where your peak pressures are really high because you can imagine you're trying to force gas through all these constricted, narrowed airways. So you get really high pressures as that gas is going through, but the alveoli beneath are actually healthy. And once the gas gets in there, the compliance and the pressure in the alveoli is actually normal. So your plateau pressures are actually fine. It's really just this really high increase in respiratory pressure. So often these patients, what you do is, I don't know if I've got here, you basically turn off the pressure alarms because the machine's gonna be alarming like crazy. Pressures are high, pressures are high, watch out. And you have to manually check the plateau pressures. So if we go back to you to this waveform, how you check the plateau pressures is you can do a thing called an inspiratory hold. So they take this breath in and then you press this button on the machine it will hold the breath there. And it basically holds the breath there for a few seconds. And you can imagine no more gas flow is occurring at that point. So the resistance from the airways is not there anymore. You're really just measuring the pressure now in the alveoli and that will flatten out to your plateau pressure. And that's the pressure you'll be measuring. And that's the pressure that will cause harm if that pressure is too high. And that's the pressure you'll be targeting for your ventilator. So you turn off your high pressure alarms and you regularly check for that plateau pressure to make sure it's not going too high. Often volume control is better because you might have to set really insanely high pressures for your pressure control modes and it can be a bit difficult to interpret. The other thing with asthma is that they can have gas trapping um, causing something called auto peep or intrinsic peep, uh, which is basically because their airways collapse down from the bronchoconstriction, they've got air left over at the end of expiration and that creates their own peep that's not given by the ventilator. So generally you wanna either set the PEEP to zero on the ventilator or set it to match their own PEEP just to keep the airway splint open. Because if you have it any higher, you're just gonna contribute again to that dynamic hyperinflation by adding more and more pressure and air in there to their collapsed airways. You want the long IE ratio one to four. And interestingly enough, if they start to become really unstable, their blood pressure starts to drop, and they become more hypoxic, you often just disconnect them from the ventilator and just wait, and it just gives time for more of that air to escape, and then you reconnect them from the ventilator. Um, so it's a bit of a, it's a bit like an opposite of what you might think, where you think, oh, the, the stats are dropping, we need to ventilate them more. In these cases, you want to have more time for expiration, you want to ventilate them less if they become more unstable. Uh, this is a last case we've got. So what's wrong with this one? Have a look at the numbers. There's a few abnormal things here. Look at the PEEP, look at the respirate, look at what volumes we're getting. What do we think about this? What condition might cause this constellation of ventilator settings? Small volumes of such high pressures. Yeah, so our compliance is really poor. So we're needing heaps of pressure. So we're needing 18 of PEEP. Um, you can see our pressures are sort of going up to nearly 50 and we're doing entire volumes about 180. So yeah, that would fit with a restrictive lung disease. And you can see here, respirate set at 30. So again, really small tidal volumes, high respiratory rate, just to try and get as much air as we can in. And you can see also our oxygenation, our SATs are set at 100%. Um, so you can imagine this person's quite hypoxic. And our PEEP is set very high as well. Um, to try and improve oxygenation. So 
This all fits with ARDS, uh, which is acute respiratory distress syndrome. And I, I didn't really learn much about this in medical school. Uh, it's more of like ICU anesthetics, um, critical care issue. Uh, and it's basically a really severe hypoxic injury with pulmonary infiltrates. And it's not from pulmonary edema. That's basically the definition. Um, no one really knows what it is. It's a bit of an unusual entity. A lot of things can cause it, drug effect, uh, really bad infection or inflammation, autoimmune conditions, burns, major trauma. Pretty much anything that can land you in ICU can eventually give you ARDS. Uh, and it's really heterogeneous entity. And it's really been well studied, but because there's so many different causes, there's a lot of different ways to measure it. And there's a lot of different literature out there. But what makes it interesting is that it's got a lot of specific ventilator settings that other conditions don't need. Um, so the issues with ARDS is firstly, you have really severe hypoxia and that's due to really poor compliance in the lungs. So you got really low tidal volumes and you need really high pressures to ventilate these patients. Because these patients need high pressures and the problem is the alveoli aren't compliant. It's not like asthma or COPD where your bronchi, your airways were constricting, you had higher resistance from that. These patients, their plateau pressures will be high. So that's the pressure we're worried about. And we deliver a lot of pressure to that. We're actually causing injury. So there's a concept called ventilator-induced lung injury. Uh, and there's a few issues there. So increased volume can cause injury. Increased pressure can cause injury, destroying basement membrane, causing pneumothorax. Uh, repeated distension and collapse of the alveoli can cause stress, injury, and damage. And there's heaps of other ways that you can damage the lungs with ARDS because you're deliver really high volumes of ventilation, high pressures to these patients. So you basically want to avoid hurting them on the ventilator while still delivering enough oxygen for them. So what sort of tidal volumes would we want for these patients? It came up earlier on the slide, but does anyone remember what tidal volumes we were delivering? So we said six to eight for the most comers, uh, but what tidal volumes would we want for these patients? Yeah, four, four to six. Yes, perfect. So again, these ones, you can put them on six as well. Uh, and then you're just straddling the line between the two groups. Um, so yeah, basically remembering six mils per kilogram will probably cover you for both of them, but four to six for these ones. And then the IE ratio is something you have to think about as well. So this is kind of the opposite problem to the gas trapping one. The gas trapping one, we want them enough time to expire. Uh, this one, we just, we're not getting the time long as we want. So we still want to ventilate them enough. And the airways are closing very quickly. So yeah. One to one ratio. Yep, perfect. So you breathe them as fast as you can because you're not going to deliver the tidal volumes without damaging them with high pressures. And then PEEP we talked about earlier. What do you want? Low PEEP, medium PEEP? So you generally want high PEEP for these patients. Um, I just showed earlier there's a, a PEEP table that you can set based on the amount of. FiO2 they need, amount of oxygen they need and delivered. Uh, and you can adjust that PEEP according to their oxygen. You can adjust the PEEP in a number of ways. You can look at their lung compliance. You can do recruitment methods where you increase, expand the lungs and see where the compliance is best. Uh, but generally these patients need high PEEP um, to improve oxygenation and keep the lungs open just because they're so fibros and the compliance is so poor. And the plateau pressure you want to keep low. If you can, you want to aim at less than 30. More than 30, you start to run into issues of barrow trauma. Um, so there's a few special terms. There's lung protective ventilation, which is the low tidal volume strategy. And there's what we call open lung ventilation, where you have high peeps and you basically keep the lungs split and open with high peep. These patients, you might need to accept that they're going to get hypercapnic uh, just because their ventilation is so terrible, their minute ventilation is so low. You might need to accept that their pH is going to be 7.2, 7.1, and their CO2 is going to be really high. Uh, as long as they maintain their oxygenation levels, that's kind of okay. Uh, and they're, they're very unwell patients. So we come to the takeaway messages. Ventilators use confusing and proprietary names. So it's best just to think about, is it a control mode or is it a support mode? Is it pressure or is it volume that we're setting? NIV and invasive ventilations have indications and contraindications, which we talked about. Uh, main ones for NIV, APO and COPD and asthma. And then invasive ventilation, we're thinking about like ARDS, pneumonia, things that you need to protect the airway for. Most patients will be fine with the default ventilator settings. So like 95% more of the patients who come in, you set them on the default ventilator settings, 500 mil tidal volumes, respirator 12, 14, whatever. 
and they'll be fine. Um, but it's important to identify the patients with obstructive or restrictive lung disease, because that's the important pathology where you're going to change your ventilation strategy. Wouldn't high PEEP cause high plateau pressures for ARDS patients? Yes, well, it's going to increase your plateau. Your plateau pressures are your combination of your PEEP and your inspiratory pressure. So you want your driving pressure to be low. So you have high PEEP and then you add just a bit of inspiratory pressure on top of that to get to your plateau. What you don't want is the really low PEEP, like let's say you had five of PEEP and then you delivered like 40 of inspired pressure on top of that. That's a really big change. And then the lungs will collapse down and the trauma from opening collapsing with that big gradient. So one really small gradient with high pressures constantly filling the airways and then little breaths on top of that. So your plateau pressure is still in a safe range um, because you're not gonna go above 30, but you've got peep, high peep keeping them open at all times. As long as you don't go above that really high plateau pressure threshold, uh, it's safe. Uh, and the high peak will help maintain oxygenation for them. Got some resources here. So definitely, if you're studying for a primary exam, you should read West's because all the exam questions come from West's and it's pretty not too bad to get through. Um, it's really good for basic respiratory physiology, um, but it's a bit dry. So unless you're doing an exam, I wouldn't be reading it. I see basic course and the course book is really good. It's very accessible. It's a really good overview. I think you need to do basic if you want to apply, like if you want to do ICU college, you need to have done basic. Um, so it's very handy. And then while looking up about this lecture, I found this, um, if you Google the Drager Oxylog trainer, they actually have an interactive web-based sort of application where you can click on the buttons and set your own ventilator setting on the buttons, which I thought was pretty cool. And that's it. Can you hear about questions? Hey. Thanks, Jeremy. Um, I'll just slit, share the Slido. Uh, let it go. Here it is. That was really helpful. Thank you so much, Jeremy. Um, Thanks. So <laughs> I just asked one question, or maybe another one if it's short, um, since we don't have a lot of time. But uh, how do you, so, one of them is how do you stop a pressure injury on the volume controlled mode? Do you have to be careful to not stack breaths? Yeah, I, any mode you're gonna to have to be careful not to stack breaths. Uh, it's gonna be looking at that expiratory flow time and just making sure the expiratory flow gets to baseline before you're delivering each breath. The big key is if that flow isn't going to zero when you deliver a breath, you are stacking breaths. So volume or pressure, you're still gonna be seeing that expiratory flow and you can still track that. Uh, but you can probably tell by the patient's pathology as well whether they're at risk and you'd probably titrate it towards the patient as well. So if they're coming with asthma, if they come with COPD, they're going to be high risk uh, and you can be on the lookout. But yeah, I usually just go about that expiratory flow. Um, and I guess maybe you could fit in like another small one. Um, maybe a brief overview of what are the um, non-invasive uh, ventilation. I'm going to pass on that because I haven't done the pediatric oh, okay. translation. <laughs> yeah. nice. And um, the last one I'm, I might the, be, I'm not sure if that's a, going to be a, a long one or if you... I don't know. I mean, peak inspiration, as we're saying, the peak pressure isn't that important because it has to bypass your airways. Uh, and in conditions with lots of bronchoconstriction, airway constriction, your peak pressures are really high. Um, normal pressure is probably like 24, 25, 20. Uh, in healthy people, it will mimic their plateau pressure. So your airway resistance is not too much higher. Um, but really peak pressure is mostly just to set the ventilator alarm. So the plateau pressure is really what's important. Right. Uh, well, that's that's all three of our questions. Um, um, and I guess we'll, I'll, we'll finish off there unless anyone has any other burning questions that they wanted to ask. Okay. Well, um, thanks, Jeremy, for, thanks again for speaking here. I feel like that was a, I feel like that was a really good, like trans, like starting off with the physiology and then a really good like application of that to practical, like, like, um, you know, the practical application of it in terms of um, in the ward and things. Thanks. Um, I think the best thing is if you get a chance to be in ICU or get a rotation, as I was saying before, like at night time, just have a go at the ventilators, no one's looking, have a fiddle with the settings. As I said, the patients can take a lot. so. You can fiddle, you can increase the peak, you can see what happens, you can increase the rest rate, see what happens. Um, 
I mean, obviously tell people that you're doing it and tell the nurse <laughs> so they don't yell at you. Uh, but yeah, it's it's quite helpful just to like be there and, and see what, what effects the things have when you do them. Yeah, that's a great thing about it. Just instant, I mean, I can email instantaneous result, responses. Sorry, I can email the slides um, and then maybe they can be posted somewhere, I don't know. Um, yeah, if you give it to us, we can we can um, send it out yep. if, you, if you like. Great. Uh, well, thanks everyone for coming. Um, and thanks, Jeremy. Um, we'll finish off there and hope you all have a good e rest of the evening. Um, look out for our next event, uh, which will be a bit later this month. Yeah, it's on cardiology. Yeah, speculation. Thanks, Jeremy. Appreciate Hi, Jeremy. it. Thanks, everyone.